Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? It is Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan alongside me. And so we're going to continue our four-part podcast series. You know, last uh, podcast, we had the great Greg Cosell on, and he'll join us again in a minute. And Greg has helped Adam and I break down the NFC East in a four-part series, part one. We did the New York Giants. And in this podcast, we will preview a new look Washington team that certainly has a lot of new additions and uh, including a new coaching staff, uh, a lot of new players. So we will get into that, Adam, myself, and of course, the great Greg Cosell from NFL Films, senior producer and co-host of the NFL Matchup Show on ESPN. Before we get to that, just want to encourage everybody to make sure they're checking out InsideTheBirds.com. We've got some fresh content up there. Andrew DeCecco, who writes for us. Uh, at InsideTheBirds.com, has also been doing a divisional preview. So he has his stories on Washington, New York, and I believe he's got Dallas and Philly coming soon as we also preview the division on the website. And uh, so make sure you're checking out us on Facebook. Also, our Facebook Inside the Birds community is over a 1,000 followers now and some great dialogue there. I know Adam and I have been popping on and conversing with some people there. So keep doing that on the Facebook, Inside the Birds Facebook community. And uh, of course, we want to thank our friends at Manscaped. And remember, for all of your grooming needs, go to manscaped.com and use that promo code ITB to get 20% off and free shipping. Listen, I use Manscaped's products. Their lawnmower is fantastic. You got to get, you got to place the order. Manscaped.com, promo code ITB. Fellas, you're doing yourselves a favor if you invest in a lawnmower. And ladies who are listening, get yourself a man a lawnmower, and you will be uh, both of you will greatly appreciate it. All right, we're going to bring in Adam Kaplan and Greg Cosell momentarily. Just want to thank everybody. Hope everyone's doing well and healthy during these times. And um, without further ado, we are about to preview Washington in part two of our NFC East outlook with myself, Adam Kaplan, and the great Greg Cosell. All right, joining us again, as promised, NFL Films senior producer Greg Cosell, and you can also see him on ESPN's NFL Matchup Show. Last time we talked to Greg, which was just a couple of days ago, he helped us break down the New York Giants. Today, we will do the Washington Redskins, a team, Greg, that I guess you can say is similar in that they've got a new coach, new staff, new scheme, and a lot of new players. Yeah, that is true. And uh, Ron Rivera, I, I happen to know very well. I think he's a really good coach. I think one thing we'll know about this team, I don't think they're super talented in many areas, but I think that a Ron Rivera team normally plays disciplined football, and it might take a little time because we've not had an off season. But uh, I think that's one thing you'll see with the Redskins as, as the season progresses. So, Greg, I know you studied Dwayne Haskins for our friends at FantasyPoints.com, and here's a guy that at least looked late last season. He started to come on a little bit. So g- give us an overview from his tape last season. Also, coming in from college, did he improve a little bit from Ohio State? Yeah, I think his tape was very uneven. Um, you know, one of the things that was a big concern coming in, and it showed up on tape last year. Now we'll see. Supposedly, he's lost a lot of weight and he's changed his body type in this offseason. But one thing that, that was a concern coming out, and as I said, showed up, was his feet are a little slow. He's a little plodding in his movement. Um, he was a kind of a pure pocket player. Now, were there plays in which he didn't move? Sure, you have to move at times in the NFL. But even when he was in the pocket, he was kind of stiff-legged a little bit. Um, He was an arm thrower. Um, He didn't really throw with torque, although I will say this, he does have a very good arm. He's just kind of an odd thrower of the football. That's the way he throws it. Um, But uh, I thought that he struggled in a number of areas. I thought he was... Uh, he struggled with what he was seeing. The term I always use instead of processing is I always use the term eliminate and isolate. And by that, I mean, you have to eliminate what's not there as quickly as possible and isolate where the throw then goes as quickly as possible. He was a little slow in that regard, but that's not surprising. He was a rookie quarterback um, coming from a system in college which was incredibly well-defined. Ohio State is really a a wonderful college system in terms of defining throws for the quarterback. So the NFL is not exactly like that. It's a different game. So uh, he needs to 
improve, not necessarily his runaround and second reaction ability, because that won't be his game in the NFL, but he needs to improve his ability to move within the pocket. That is absolutely critical for guys who are pocket quarterbacks. They must be able to navigate within the pocket, find space, and throw the football. He showed some improvement in that as the season progressed. He was able to climb the pocket at times, but he must continue to get much, much better at that to reach uh, the level that his pure throwing ability suggests he might be able to reach. How would you describe what you saw in his footwork uh, as far as being in the pocket? And and you said, you mentioned he, he, he can climb it. He saw that, but overall in general. I would say it was probably below average. Um, his feet are, are, like I said, they're a little heavy. Um, I actually had one scout that I really respect at the combine the year he came out, used the word wooden describing his feet. So Ooh. there was a definite oh. concern about, um, you know, his ability just to move his feet. I'm not even, like I said, we're not talking about running around. We're just talking about within the pocket because there's a lot of quarterbacks who are not great athletes. You can look at Tom Brady. What do you run a five, four? We know he's not a great athlete in the way we think of athletes, but a guy like Tom Brady was always wonderful and moving within the pocket. Um, that's what Taskins has to do. His feet need to become lighter. Uh, and then I read he's down to 218 pounds that he played last year at over 235. Adam, you may know more about this from people you've spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, that is an absolutely essential for him. He's got to sort of change his whole body type. You know, you, you watched him on tape last year and he just didn't have the body type of an NFL quarterback. So uh, we'll see when the season starts. Uh, but, you know, he definitely needs to be lighter on his feet within the pocket. And plus, they, the word around the team was he needed to mature a little bit and kind of grow no up. Question. And, and that's a great sign, Greg, as you mentioned, is losing his weight. So one thing we know that Ron Rivera loves is that running game, and they've got so many running backs. Adrian Peterson, Darius Geis, Bryce Lovecombe back from ACL reconstruction, uh, J.D. McKissick, sort of a changeup. Peyton Barber's there, and a guy that I know you love, because you talked about him uh, with John Hansen and I on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio, is Antonio Gibson from Memphis, Greg. What did you like about Gibson State? Well, let me just start it this way. We have to start with what their offense will be. Mm -hmm. Scott Turner, who was the quarterback coach in Carolina under Ron Rivera and the son of Norv Turner, is the OC. So you, it's going to be the Norv Turner offense. So it's going to be the play-action pass game. I personally think, maybe I'll be dead wrong, I personally think Antonio Gibson is best served in the NFL by being a slot receiver. And I think on this team – Given their receiving core, that's where he would fit best. Now, they may make him a running back. I can't speak to that. No one's on the field right now. They have an abundance of running backs. I think Antonio Gibson is a big, explosive, dynamic athlete. Last year in, at Memphis, he played predominantly in the slot. He only had 33 rushes last year at Memphis. Now, he averaged something like 11 yards a rush. The guy is really dynamic. But he was a receiver primarily last year and a slot receiver. And when you look at their receiving core, I think he'd be best served for the Redskins to be a slot receiver. Now, I, you know, again, I don't know how they see him right now. Um, you know, only time will tell. Yeah, I believe early on he's going to be learning running back. But let's get back to his tape. He, he would, you know, he was sort of dynamic. You thought he, he could play slot. You know, you look at his build and some of the skills, Greg. From that tape study, was it in space? Did he beat defenders? Like, how did he uh, look so good to you on tape there? Well, in, in some ways, he's built very much like Lavisca Chenault from the Colorado Kings. Oh, there you go. They're well, about the same size, about six yeah. feet, six one, two hundred twenty-seven, two hundred twenty-eight pounds. Mm. Big, competitive, explosive, straight line athletes. Um, you know, Gibson. I would, he's certainly not a refined, nuanced route runner at this point in his career, but he worked out of the slot. Um, they threw a ton of wide receiver screens to him. He's really good run after catch uh, because he's competitive. He's physical. Um, so, you know, he's one of those guys that could be used in multiple ways. Then the question comes down to the coordinator, how Scott Turner uh, chooses to use a player like that. Um, you know, obviously, Norv Turner's whole approach throughout his career, a very successful career, was pretty straightforward. So the question is, you know, Scott being the son and with the changing nature and evolving nature of the NFL game, does a guy like Gibson 
end up being used at times like the 49ers used to Debo Samuel Mm -hmm. because you want to get the ball in his hands. You start seeing jet sweeps, orbit reverses, the wide receiver screen game. You know, I'm not sure. Again, this is just me talking. I don't know how they see it. I'm not sure he's your feature back. You're not handing the ball to him 18 times a game. I mean, Peterson's still there. If Darius Geis is healthy, he's a really good back. Um, you know, Gibson's not getting 18 carries a game. So you want to find ways to get this kid the ball. It, it sounds to me, Greg, like the challenge for this team, if they really want to work off play action and get that running game going like Ron would do in Carolina, is that they've got, you know, uh, Adrian Peterson, who's effective, but not necessarily explosive anymore. He's over the age of 30, well over. Darius Geis has not stayed healthy. Antonio Gibson is a hybrid type of player and Bryce Love is coming off an injury and they, they don't seemingly have a very reliable running back stable here so that you can say yeah we want to run the ball you know 28 to 30 times and really support Dwayne Haskins maybe Peyton Barber to me is kind of a sleeper guy who becomes very important to their offense yeah and I always thought Peyton Barber was the kind of guy but that if you gave him the ball 240 times he'd gain a thousand yards now he wouldn't be dynamic the, right. but the big issue and it needs to be discussed is their offensive line, and that's a big question mark. And I'm sure you guys are going to get to that yes, anyway. Correct. Mm-hmm. Left I mean, tackle. Good Jeff. transition. Yeah, yeah, left, guys. Left tackle, Greg, is a big they concern. Don't, yeah, they don't have one. And left no. guard also. Now, now, Sadiq Charles was was drafted in the fourth round. He, he's probably going to be a guard. They don't have a left tackle. The right, you know, the right side is a great Brandon Sheriff and obviously Morgan Moses. But Greg, you you look at their tape from last season, and he, obviously you, you studied Dwayne Haskins. How much of a concern is their offensive line to you? It's a big concern, not only for the run game, but because Haskins needs to be protected. Haskins is not a quarterback that can function without protection. So uh, now, again, you can help that with your play calling, um, but that that's the way it is in normal down and distance. Obviously, if you start getting into long yardage situations, that becomes a little bit of an issue. But the left side of their own line is a concern. I mean, you t- the, the two left tackles on the roster right now are, are Cornelius Lucas uh, kind of a journeyman who's been in the league, and he's about 6'8", 340. Um, and Geron Christian, who's actually got a lot of ability, but we'll see if he can play a left tackle. Sadiq Charles is a fascinating guy. He played tackle at LSU. He has tackle skills. Uh, I know a lot of people see him as a guard. His tape was maddening. There were times he looked like he was a first-round talent at tackle, and other times he just looked like he was a free agent. So... Mm. You know, that's why he's a fourth round pick at him, as you know, you know, so we'll see how that all plays out. But Wes Schweitzer, who's been in the league now for a number of years and has started a lot of games, he's listed at their left guard. But, you know, uh, again, that left side is, is if we're being kind, let's call it a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> we get uh, well, well, one guy that was not a question mark for the Eagles last year, or he kind of was, he was a puzzle that they could not solve. And that was the rookie, uh, scary yeah. Terry McLaurin. Um, what did you, do you remember what you, you, uh, saw uh, in Terry? Did you scout him coming out of Ohio state? And, and so were you not surprised or a little bit surprised by how well he acclimated as a rookie? Um, well, coming out, I saw him as, a, as a, an explosive athlete. I saw him in, in, in ways that I saw Tyler Lockett coming out of college, you know, when, when the Seahawks drafted him. As I recall, and I'm not looking at my notes, obviously, I'm just trying to remember, but McLaurin is under six feet. He can run. Um, he's an explosive athlete. Um, I did not see him as a volume receiver coming out of Ohio State. Um, Maybe he turns into that. He Look, he played a ton of X last year. I must admit, I did not see him as an X coming out of Ohio State, but he did play X. Um, caught a lot of short passes and exploded. You know, that you mentioned the Eagles play. He had a 75-yard touchdown against the Eagles where he caught a slant. And he, and he just, you know, I don't know if the safety, I forget who the safety was. It might have been Epps, but I don't want to knock Epps. He put it you know, throw him under the bus if it wasn't Epps. But the safety took a really bad angle, and he uh, and he just, you know, ran away from everybody. He's an explosive kid. Um, like I said, I don't know if he'll end up being a big volume receiver and catch 90 balls, but he is truly, uh, you know, a guy – he's a home run hitter. Why, why – if I can follow up, why why do you think he played the X so well? I assume you, you weren't sure because you didn't know how he would be able to beat press coverage. Size. It, it, yeah, yeah, size. Yeah, size, because, you know, when you're on the ball, the X receiver's on the ball. So that means when you're pressed, 
the guy's literally right in your face. You're not off the ball. You know, the Z is off the ball because he's on the tight end side. So the X is on that side where there's no other receiver. So he has to be on the ball or it's a penalty. So then you get press. And you know, I, I, it wasn't that I didn't think he could do it. I wasn't sure. You know, he's mm-hmm. a smaller guy and he's, and he's frail looking on tape. You know, I don't know what he looks like in person, but on tape he looks small. So I just didn't know if he was an X at the NFL level. And the one issue that teams have with him, Greg, was that his college production simply was not very good. He didn't have no. great numbers. The tape was good. It was intriguing, but you, you couldn't stand on the table and take him in the second. It fell to the third. But staying at that right wide receiver position, Steven Sims had to play because they were struggling at the position other than McLaurin. He, he was a nice surprise as, as a college free agent. Yeah, uh, I liked him. Trey Quinn is a slot receiver. Kelvin Harmon is also there. was a six-round pick. But moving towards this year's draft class, the one guy they did draft is very intriguing, Greg, Antonio Gandy-Golden from Liberty. Give us an idea of what you saw from him. Golden is the exact same measurements as Michael Pittman of USC, 6'4", 223. Now, there are teams that automatically will look at a player from a school like Liberty and, and downgrade him because the level of competition. And that's reasonable. You know, there, there's plenty of scouts who Adam, you and I both respect who that's the way they think about it. You know that you've talked with the many scouts mm-hmm. over the years, even if they love the talent, they'll just say, Hey, he didn't play in a power five conference. I can't draft that kid in the first two rounds, but he has a very intriguing set of traits. He's big. He can run a little bit. He's got build-up speed. He's not, a, obviously, guys like that are not necessarily explosive burners, but he's got build-up speed. He's competitive. Um, I found him to be a fascinating prospect. Uh, you know, again, a fourth-round pick. I think he'll get every opportunity to get meaningful snaps. You know, Kelvin Harmon was a sixth-round pick the year before. Um, you know, he put up some decent numbers last year. I think when all said and done, Harmon is – probably not quite as as dynamic as you would ultimately like um and i think andy golden will get an opportunity to compete for that that z position and we'll see how it goes you know with no true on the field off season you know that could hurt a guy like andy golden you want to see him on the field one question about andy golden in the future is there a is there a possibility that they can move him uh Gandy golden to x because, you know, you, you'd said yes. you weren't sure if, if McLaurin could play yes. X. So could you see that happening? Yes, uh, for sure. See, that's the thing. I mean, I always I looked at someone like McLaurin as a guy who would be a more of a movement guy, the Z, because those guys you can put in motion. And when you put Zs in motion, what normally happens is if it's man coverage, you can't press guys in motion very well. And you want guys like McLaurin with their explosive short area burst and long speed to have free access off the line of scrimmage. And that's why I saw McLaurin more as kind of a movement Z. And maybe down the road, if Gandy Golden develops Adam, like you're suggesting, which and I think he could develop, he, with that size and movement and ability to make contested catches along the sideline, which is critical for an X, I think Andy Golden could be an X and McLaurin could be a Z. Greg, as far as tight end goes, we know down in Carolina, you know, for a long time, Greg Olson in that offense, but obviously with no um, Jordan Reed there anymore, and uh, it looks yeah. like they're kind of remaking that position. I don't know if it's going to have the same impact that it's had for either Washington or Ron Rivera had in Carolina. What do you, what do you see from their tight end spot? Well, probably the most intriguing guy is their free agent daddy is Moss, because I think Moss is, is a guy who can detach. Um, mm. They don't really have another tight end who can detach uh, meaningfully. You know, Jeremy Sprinkle is, I remember watching Sprinkle, I believe he came out of Arkansas, and I thought he had a chance to be one of those solid tight ends because he can block, he can play on the line of scrimmage, he can catch the ball a little bit, he's not unathletic, and maybe he becomes that guy in this particular offense. Um, But I think Stadius Moss, you know, will get an opportunity because we saw at LSU, a team that lined up in shotgun a ton and sent five out all the time. Moss was detached from the formation pretty much all the time, and that's – you know, I think that's an important role in today's NFL. You need a tight end who can do that. Absolutely. All right. Well, that'll be a change of pace for them. To uh, we'll see how Thaddeus Moss develops. But obviously, Randy Moss's Jordan. son, right? Randy yes. Moss, correct. Yeah. Randy Moss's that? son from national champion from LSU. Uh, we're going to move on from the offense, go into the defense. A lot of talent 
on that oh, side yeah. of the ball. Uh, before we go into the defense, I want to thank our friends at PHLSportsNation.com, continuing to enhance the fan experience with their coverage of the Flyers, Sixers, Eagles, and Phillies, and all their great content podcast got to check it out phl sportsnation.com we thank them for their partnership and also we'll pause real quick for a word from our sponsors all right greg we're going to get into this washington defense certainly uh for whatever we said about the offensive line and and it being <laughs> kind of a you know not not as talented and, and a work in progress this d line this front seven it's got some talent in it they got a lot of talent on defense we'll see you know when they got ron rivera and jack del rio Two mm-hmm. veteran NFL defensive coaches who've been doing it a long time and understand the league. So again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they'll be a top three defense, but when you just look at the talent on this defense, they got a lot of talent. Five first and, rounders, Greg. Five former first rounders. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at this front seven, you know, they've got Montez Sweat. Okay, let's start there. First round pick in 19. They got Payne. They got Allen. They got Kerrigan and Young. Those are all first round picks, like you said. I mean, that is a pretty damn good for I love Duran Payne. And and I know I spoke to the people who love Jonathan Allen. I mean, this is a really, really good group up front. Um, we'll see if Thomas Davis has anything left at all. I didn't think he played badly for the Chargers last year. So I, I you know I, I don't know. He's just at that stage in his career where you don't know. Um you know, I thought the kid who was a rookie last year, Cole Holcomb, did not play badly. I don't know if you've talked to anybody about him, Adam, you know, in your right. conversations. Yeah. yeah. I did not think watching tape, you know, that he played badly at all. Um, mm. He's a pretty athletic kid. Um, and they've got an interesting mix in the secondary. Uh, that would probably be viewed as the one question mark for, on this defense. But I don't think it's a weakness per se. I just think there are some questions. So speaking of those questions, you know, you, you, you've you talked glowingly about the D-line and you and obviously the front seven is very talented, but a couple issues that I think people have in their secondary, they bring in Ronald Darby, who was obviously very up and down with the Eagles. Yeah. Fabian Moreau, I know you and I talked about him years ago, coming out of UCLA. He's long. He could run a little bit. But when you grit, when you look at their tape from last season and, and, and you just kind of look at how they can match up against a team like the Eagles, who now finally – Greg, you can no longer say the Eagles are the slowest team in offense. No, they've got a lot of. Got, they can run now. They can run now. Could you? Could could the Redskins secondary match up against the Eagles if they don't get home? Um, well, because we don't know how it's going to play out in the secondary. You know, Moreau, I assume would start on Moreau and Fuller and Darby. Two of those three are going to be the outside corners. You know, we don't we don't know what Darby's situation is right now, but two of those three are going to be on the outside. I actually like Jimmy Moreland in the slot quite a bit. I think he's got a chance to be a good player. Um, now, Fuller and Moreau are not burners per se, but, you know, I think they can be solid NFL corners. Kendall Fuller, you know, he's a solid player. Um, so we'll see how that plays out, you know, and who their starters are. Um, at safety, they're going to – they have Landon Collins, who's a certain kind of safety, and they've got Sean Davis, who has corner skills. He played both safety and corner at the University of Maryland. You know, I guess he'll play on the back end. He'll be viewed as their free safety, but he's a long, athletic kid. Um, we know Collins is a strong safety, not a free safety. He's not a post player. Um, so, you know, they've got a lot of size. They've got, they've got some, you know, some physicality to them. The question, and you hit it right on the head, is how will they match up on the outside if you want to play a lot of man coverage? How will they match up? And we don't know the answer to that right now. Get, getting back to the defensive line and the front seven, really. And look, I don't want to – I'm going to put this out here right now, Greg, so no one starts hitting me up on social media after they hear this. I, I don't think Washington is going to the Super Bowl. All right? I'm going to put that out <laughs> preface. However, <laughs> what I really see as a similarity between them – and the San Francisco 49ers of last year is that for so long that they were bad and they collected a lot of pass rushers in the first round, high in the first round. And I feel like when you look at those first those five you mentioned, uh, Montez Sweat, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, Ryan Kerrigan, and Chase Young, I think it's fair to say uh, that while we have to see Chase Young play just based on reputation alone, this is going to be one of the top pass rushers or front lines in, in the NFL. I feel confident in saying that they're going to take some teams by surprise with that. 
Oh, I don't know how many teams they'll take by surprise. Yeah, maybe that, not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that uh, a lot of those guys are considered pretty good players and I would expect Chase Young to be a good player and who knows how many sacks he'll have. And again, that doesn't mean he's not a good player if he only has seven sacks, but uh no, this is a really, really good front with a lot of dimensions, too. I mean, I, th- I thought Montez Sweat was a fascinating prospect coming out the year prior. Um, and then those two inside guys, Payne and Allen, are really, really good. You know, Ryan Kerrigan has given the Eagles trouble literally every game that, that mm-hmm. he's played against the Eagles. So mm-hmm. this is a really good front. You know, they re-signed John Bostic as well, who has been in the league a long time. Not a great player, but he's been in the league a long time, and he's kind of a savvy veteran type. So this front seven is pretty good with a chance to be – Almost special, really, if you think Matt, about it. Matt Ionitis yeah. is a good football player. We don't. He's a really yes. He's a guy we should yeah. mention too. He's yeah. a really good player, and I, you know, I know that uh, the previous coaching staff loved Tim Settle. So hmm. you know, uh, they've got a lot of really good players. Interestingly, with Chase Young, um, how would you compare him to the two Bosa brothers who you know play the same position at Ohio State and both had instant success in the NFL? How do you see Chase among those three? I think Chase Young is more explosively athletic and I think the Bosa brothers use their hands better and just have a better intuitive feel for how to do that and play against the leverage of of offensive tackles. I think that the Bosa brothers, as well as any defensive ends in the league, know how to play off contact extremely Mm. well. They do that better than Chase Young, but just as a pure explosive athlete, I think Young's more purely explosive. I, you know, a real X factor we haven't talked about is Reuben Foster. Uh, and I don't know what their situation with him is. I know yeah, he had yeah, he, he's come back to me. So, yeah, he, he, but you know, Jeff, it's interesting. I remember talking to Greg before the draft when he was mm-hmm. with San Francisco. I, I distinctly remember, Jeff, that Greg told me this kid is, is super talented. So, so, and I know, Greg, it's been a while, it's been like three, four years. But about just, Foster? Yeah, I, yeah. I remember you liked him, but obviously, we're just talking about talent and we're not talking about off the field. What, what kind of talent did he bring uh, as a linebacker well, in Alabama? I mean, Reuben Foster, to me, and I, I remember speaking to some GMs, guys you talked to as well, Adam, who told me that Reuben Foster in that draft was a top three player in the draft, mm. but he wasn't going to be drafted like that mm. for many reasons. Um, but Reuben Foster is an explosive moving athlete. Now, he's been injured, so we don't know where he stands, but he was an explosive moving athlete. He almost played linebacker like he was a running back. Um, tremendous wow. range, tremendous physicality. People are concerned about that because he's not 250 pounds. It's been hard and a lot. Were, yeah. yeah, and they were concerned sure. now with his physicality and just competitive toughness that he'd be banged up all the time just because he's, you know, smaller. But he, he had everything you wanted for a stacked linebacker. You know, he could play sideline to sideline. He could mix it up and was willing to mix it up. He could run. He could cover. I mean, he was a dynamic, dynamic prospect. Hmm. Any reason, Greg, to think that Ronald Darby will fare better in Jack Del Rio's scheme than he would than he did in Jim Schwartz's scheme, just based on scheme alone and what will be asked of him? Um, well, you know, I think in Philly, they play both man and zone. I don't know the specific percentages right now. I imagine they played relatively evenly, you know, I don't, mm-hmm. uh, they didn't strike me. And, I, and the thing is I have all these numbers in my office. I just haven't been in my office in a long time. Um, you know, I think that Washington will be very similar in the sense that they'll mix and match. They're not going to be specific to one. If they play more than one, I think they play more zone than man. That would be my sense. Um, but, uh, you know, Darby, Darby's always lived off the fact that he could run. And, uh, you know, he's been injured a lot now, so that becomes a question mark. Interesting, Greg. You know, we've now gone through Washington, and we did the Giants in the last podcast, and I can't help but think about kind of all the the similarities. They're not, you know, apples and apples, but new coaches, right, second-year quarterbacks, struggling offensive lines, uh, some players on defense that both are, are pretty happy with right now. Maybe Washington a little bit more ahead there on defense with that front, but the Giants may be a little bit more ahead on offense with their playmakers. As you've kind of analyzed both of those teams with me, does one stick out to you as a little bit more ahead than the other and and ready to compete a little bit more than the other? 
Well, if you're just looking offensively, I would say the Giants would be a little bit ahead. But I think defensively, the Redskins are far more talented. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, far more talented. Way ahead. Um, you know, I think Jones just as – while he doesn't have the pure arm strength of Haskins, I think in the subtleties and nuance – and the disciplined craft nature of the quarterback position that Jones is ahead of Haskins, but Haskins can get there and Haskins is a better pure thrower. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the Redskins have many more questions to answer on offense than the Giants do. Uh, so, but these are two teams that, uh, you know, both teams are going to be hurt to, to a meaningful degree by the fact that there was no on-field offseason. Absolutely. All right. Well, we have done Washington. We've done the Giants, but we are not done with you yet, Greg, because we're going to bring you back uh, for the next two pods. We'll talk about, of course, the Dallas Cowboys and then finish it off with the Philadelphia Eagles. Want to thank you once again, Greg Cosell from NFL Films, the senior producer, as well as ESPN's NFL matchup uh, show. Fantastic jobs on both. Fantastic job uh, on ITB. We really appreciate it. Look forward to speaking to you again about the Cowboys and the Eagles. Thanks for joining us again, Greg. Oh, thanks guys. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Remember sports are coming back and, but casino games, they never left. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino has an endless amount of casino games to play all from the comfort and safety of your home. And right now, first time casino players on DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino can play risk-free up to $200 for their first 24 hours of casino play. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app in casino right now and find the casino games in the top navigation bar to start playing. Options. You want options. Choose from slots and blackjack, roulette, table games, with live dealers, and more. DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino is a legal, safe, and secure than secure gaming app. You can deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. Plus, DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino has new promotions every day, so be sure to check the app daily. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook and Casino app right now and use promo code ITB to play up to $200 of casino games risk-free. That's promo code ITB to play risk-free up to $200 for your first 24 hours of casino play on DraftKings Sportsbook must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only in partnership with Hollywood Casino and Penn National Race Course. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, so we've wrapped up half of the division. We've gone through the Giants. We've gone through Washington. We've got the Dallas Cowboys and, of course, the Philadelphia Eagles up next as we uh, round out the NFC East four-part podcast uh, preview outlook uh, in podcasts to come. So I just want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks. That's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles and Intel. Big thanks, as always, to Greg Cosell, the GOAT, who's going to continue to help us preview the rest of the NFC East. And thanks, of course, to our producer, Hunter Brody. Check out his work on YouTube. It's called Sports Talk with Broads. And check out his podcast called Process. He does that with former Villanova basketball star Daryl Reynolds. Uh, check out Hunter also on Twitter at Broads81. Thanks to our friends at 97.3 ESPN. And make sure you're downloading their free mobile app and you can hear either Adam or myself or Andrew DeCecco doing football at four at four o'clock every single day on 97.3 ESPN. But if you miss it, we put it up on our YouTube page. So go to Inside the Birds YouTube page and subscribe. All right. As always, we thank you for flying with us inside the bird.